affect it when you, if it's properties or good questions? I don't know. So they they have they they are able to make really standard um, in the lab if you're very care careful you can get specific materials outcomes and so they they do things like right now a lot of uh, there are bone screws that people use that are made out of silk um, so that way the 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 screw never has to be removed you never have to do anything to it the body just goes around it and eventually consumes it and replaces it. Um, and so you can get very hard materials, or you can get gels and even foams out of it. Um, and so it's all in the processing. Um, and then if you want to get a specific, one of the tricky parts with 3D printing and with any sort of DIY materials creation is the material property that you get may have a variance. It's not always the strongest. It may have a difference one way or another. And so um, uh, that's one of the challenges of, the, of doing the processing from start to finish yourself, um, is being able to know what that is and to get that. Yeah. So just trying to go back and think of the advantages of this over other su sorts of substrates. And it sounds like one of them that you mentioned that's really cool is its compatibility with human tissues or, or otherwise. Like it can be. We, our bodies won't reject it in the same way that they would other kinds of plastics or something like that. Is that one of the advantages? That yeah, so it's totally biofriendly. Mm -hmm. um, so it can yeah, it can go into your skin. It can go now. I those are all things that people are doing right now, and I think that's cool. One of the big advantages I think for a, sort of a DIY thing, and why I'm excited about it, is because it allows us to bring. Uh, biology into making things. Mm -hmm. So, nowhere like bringing in making this enzyme activated is if you couldn't. It, it'd be hard to imagine how to do that in another way. You might be able to uh, fix an enzyme to a surface and do like a surface co coating, but to actually have the material be impregnated with an with an enzyme is interesting. So there is. Right. And, this, and that's the way that life actually does a lot of materials. So in the, um, in the oyster stomach, so when the oyster eats something, it has this kind of like a piece, like a chunk of clear plastic. And it's called the, um, I don't know what it's called. It's called like the, it's called the, it's like a, it's like the crystalline en en entity, but that's not what it's called. It's, um, it's, anyway, it's got a funny name. Oyster cocoon stuff. Yeah, and it just sits there and it's made out of these enzymes. And so as it wear, wears down, it uh, creates, it digests food. Um, and so you can imagine you could almost put like detergent or cleaning enzymes in this and throw it in your washer. And then over time, it would just, you never would need to, you wouldn't need to put it in there until that little silk ball disappeared. And it was, that was just natural. And so when they're doing that now, the pods and things that you throw in the washer, that, what's in those? Plastics or what? I mean, Little. Yeah, those are plastics and then detergents inside. And so this would be much more environmentally friendly than that. Yeah. That's it, another advantage then? I, it is. I mean, I think the biocompatibility of it's an advantage and the ability to put like active biological material into the silk, because the silk actually stabilizes enzymes. So how do, you, how do you do that part? How do you put stuff into the silk? You just, in the liquid phase, if this was liquid, you just inject uh, <laughs> directly in there, and so, and then, it, and then you mix it up, and it's in there. So that's what's nice about this is um, it's kind of liquid. It's actually a liquid crystal. It's like a thick liquid, and when you inject it in there, the whatever you put in there gets organized within. That the, in will the it take just about everything? Well, people haven't tried everything. It, I tried putting um, diatoms in there, mm -hmm. and it didn't really work. So what diatoms? Uh, I put ones that, you know, when you go out in the ocean at night and you make a splash and it close, um, I really wanted to try and do, so I made like a piece of film, like a, a plastic that when you hit it, it would glow. Um, it didn't really work. They were a little bit too big, I think, and also the salt that they, 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 they were in, and I, I probably killed them in, in the process. But, um, um, so I think there are limits to what you can do. But definitely people have successfully done lots of different enzymes. 
um, is, is on the table. So it conducts electricity. The, there are ways of doping it so it has it, yeah. So when you add certain things to it, it can conduct electricity. It, it's optical, so it conducts light very well. Yeah. Could it stabilize DNA? Like, could you create a little matrix of different genomes and kind of categorize them and have a little library embedded in so? Yes, you totally could. That would be, that's a, that's a crazy idea. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but most of the applications medical? I think most of the applications are not medical. I, the, that's where all the funding is right now for the labs. Mm -hmm. For me, one of the things that I'm interested in is in, um, I don't know exactly what all the applications are, but I think, so for example, I think you, you, you could make a knife out of silk, right? So what you do is you would just add, um, like that's what this, so this makes it harder and stiff, stiffer. If you start adding some metals to it, you can get on really hardness and you could have, so a squid beak, if, you've, if you know a squid beak, have you ever felt a squid beak? So squid are like, they have this beak, or octopus, they have this beak in there, but they're made out of like goo, and their beak is made out of protein too. And what it, their beak actually never has an end, so it's this really, really hard, it's one of the hardest um, substances in, in nature, but it's a protein mixed with copper and melanin, and, and it, it um, but as the beak goes back in, into the organ, it just kind of gets softer and softer and softer and softer. And it never really ends. It just kind of becomes more of the octopus. And, and so having a gradient protein structure, you couldn't do that in another kind of material system. But you could totally do that with silk. Um, so we could make like one edge of the silk is really hard and stiff, and the other edge is super gooey and soft, and it's the same thing. And it's just as flexible on this side and really hard over here. So, um, it almost sounds like you can make a sending them up there. Okay. Yeah. That'd be cool. <laughs> well, I mean, you're talking about, yeah. oh, just in like a charge separation. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, I'm sure you probably could. I mean, you could. <laughs> is there a uh, sort of a cost that you could? I mean, in terms of the, is it would be cost efficient to make daily objects, or would it be something that would be kind of limited for a specialty item? Or is there a great question? Mm -hmm. So it because it takes so you know I probably spent a couple hours to get to a glumpy state that's not going to work. Then I'll probably spend a couple more hours to go get it right. Um, so there's that amount of time just to get this amount of stuff the way that I currently process it. Um, the actual cost isn't that much per thing. These, I'm only using 15 of these, and these are pretty cheap. The, the, the chemicals are just bulk chemicals that are industrial ones that you can, you can buy by the pound and you're only using like milligrams of. Um, so all the materials are relatively inexpensive. The most expensive thing is the dialysis. And so each of these probably takes a, um, like a $10 dialysis bag. And so that's the limiting cost. Everything else is pennies, basically. Um, so from a materials cost standpoint, that it's the dialysis that makes it go from you know, 50 cents to $10.50 or $20.50 um, per batch. Are there some ideas for alternatives for doing that process? That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> right now, because right now there's never been a demand for it, right? Because, and that's one of the things that I'd love to try and, ta and tackle. Is because from a craft standpoint, it'd be great to have cheaper, less like right now. I'm using just tap water rather than like pure filtered water, just to see if that works. Like I'm trying to like make it less of a hassle because I'm not going to implant it in someone's body. I'm not making like things that are going to go in your brain, or I don't have to go with lab level everything. I'm just trying to like cook it in my kitchen. And so this is a, <clears throat> how do I lower those steps down? Um, and as you can see, I'm sort of failing along the way, but the, the, that's probably the biggest one that I'm most, inti most intimidated by, is how to make a, how to purify that silk in a way that I can get rid of the lithium bromide without 
using a membrane. And there may be alternatives, just like throw it really quickly into like something. That's centrifuge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. What's, what is the craft community like for this? I think this is this is it. <laughs> no, so you're the only one. <laughs> it's me. Um, so there, there's, there's a group in Boston. So I, I moved from Boston about a year ago, um, and I worked at a design firm there. And this was this is all, they were really fascinated by this idea, and so they've started a, a small scale silk processing thing like like this, and they they have the advantage of also working with the labs in the in the area that are doing doing it, and so there's a couple people out there who are playing with it, um, but that's really about it. There aren't that many. One of the things that I am actually excited about is potentially writing more grants for this kind of work. Um, it's on my list of things, but I'd like to figure out ways to get funding for for this to become more of a more of an accessible craft. In part because I do think it has it brings up that whole new element of working with biology yeah. in a craft setting, which which we can't I can't think of any other way to do it. And over the over the last you know five years that I've been work, working on trying to figure this out. This seems like it really is honestly the best way to start merging all of the amazing cool things that are going on in biology that we know from nature, like squid beaks and all these crazy things that they do. How could we make stuff like that? And this is a bridging te te technology, but it has to be accessible to people who know how to make things. Well, there are women in India weaving diabetic pet, uh, pet strips out of silk. And now I'm wondering whether it's ordinary silk or maybe something like this made from silk. Wait, it's cheaper than doing it in a factory. Oh, that's amazing. Cool. Is this, once it's processed, is that it? Or are there ways to get back to state zero or, or something like that? Like recyclability of whatever you make, can you toss it back into the pile at some point? Good question. I don't know. Fibroin, I would say the general, I wouldn't try to. Um, the general model for this is you use safe things all along the, pro the process so when you're done it can just be eaten by something. Mm -hmm. um, would, would be ideal. I wouldn't want to need to have to go back to that step. Um, one of the interesting things about, I think, silk is that it already has that component of being like biodegradable, which then is you know nature's recycling system kind of. And so that, ideally for me, that, that's where I try and take it. Um, also, in part, I think any kind of other things you put into it may continue to just build, and the fibroid might be further and further degraded. Um, so the protein lengths and all these things that you're trying to control for to get a good protein mush on the, on the other side probably gets harder and harder the more you do that. Yeah. Um, so right now, you, you can take cocoons like this and make them, or, or you can take just raw silk, even silk ties and stuff. Although. Um, they say, they say like if you take you know your father's slip tie and cut it up and put it in here, that um, he'll be mad. That he'll be mad. Put it down. Because uh, that was an expensive way to do that. Um, but you have to remove the dyes from things like that. So there are ways I think to remove it and get get it back, but it might be more trouble than it's worth. Mm -hmm. But you also like if we were to be implanting this with certain kinds of enzymes or other materials, you wouldn't want to necessarily throw that in a compost pile either, would you? I mean, or would you? I, I think most of the bio, like, so enzymes, there's millions of enzymes everywhere. Right. I wouldn't mind throwing right. enzymes away. Um, uh, or eating them, right? Or whatever. Like, you could, um, that's the thing, is there's so many weird things to do with this that it, it, it's hard, that you could start to, um, think about would you want to, if you put like bacteria on this that were specific to an area, would you want to then put it in a new place? Probably not. Like, I can imagine ways that you would dope it in a fashion that you wouldn't want to put it back um, in the environment. But I mean, I'm just thinking about people reacting to it in sort of a GMO kind of way, going, oh no, you know. Well, I think that's another thing that I that I do like about the silk smithing idea is that. We're not doing anything different than anyone's done for thousands of years from an organismic standpoint, from a farming standpoint. You're still just dealing with silkworms doing their thing, making silk. And they've been domesticated for a long time, making silk for, for us. And so it's the same industrial process. It's just we're now putting that protein into a high-tech 
sort of a high-tech use. Um, so there isn't really any genetic engineering. And it's, that's another thing that I love about it is because it's not genetic, because everyone thinks like SynBio, if you go and talk SynBio or biohacking or all these things, they're a lot of times talking about, I want to change the DNA of the organism to like, and people have problems with that, and, and it can go in strange places, and it can be very difficult to do, and we're getting better at it, but is that a good thing? Like all these questions right. come up. And this is, a, this is more of a craft. It's like, I'm learning how to manipulate this material in a way to get, to get interesting things. And I, you know, now I can manipulate this to get like test strips, diabetic test, you could probably make a diabetic test strip out of stuff. Or you could you know, 3D print something that would glow or whatever that, that uses firefly in that. So you don't think you would have any problem with granting agencies saying you guys shouldn't be playing this in your kitchens? What's no. You know? I think that's the strength of this is they'd be like, oh my gosh, that's a great idea for getting people engaged in, in using using biology or engaging with biological design, like designing the way nature does. Uh, getting us to think outside the box of where we currently are and to working with proteins in a in a DIY setting kind of thing. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, are there, um, this, is, this is pretty verified air we're breathing here, uh, it sounds like. Um, are there, uh, a lot of the things you're talking about, you're talking about, I mean, you're, you're mentioning possibilities of taking these proteins and, and adding them to such and such. Um, but for me at least, um, that's, that's pr pretty much of a black box. Are they, um, now, are there any books on the subject? <laughs> <laughs> it is very rarefied air, we should write a book. Yeah. No. Yeah. No, you know, the, the, well, so this okay. is, this is an interesting so thing. Like, so how, so as a biologist, this is stuff that we do in the lab all the time. Like you get, you just go online and you order the luciferin protein and it comes and it's just a powder mm -hmm. and you just add it to things and it does what it says it's gonna do. You actually have no idea. They could be sending you chalk. You have no clue what is in there because you can't see it. We don't, you know. So as a biologist, I'm, I am very used to uh, working with enzymes that I don't know and mm -hmm. y you never know because it's just a little thing in a piece of water. Uh, and so, for me, this has always felt very accessible, but I don't know how accessible the actual processing is to other people. Or, when I, you know, if I gave you a bunch of silk goop, like, what would you do with it? Like, could you, I mean, the first thing to do is just pour it on the table and let it dry and see what happens, I think, is what I did. And I was like, oh, that's cool, it's drying now, this thing, right? Um, I, I think everyone should just do that, right? Just to see it do that. And maybe then be like, what if I had to die? Or what if I, what if I made it into a ball? What if I could make like a container that made it into a ball rather than? I think that is the level that I'm really hoping to achieve early on. Adding enzymes and doing all that stuff, I would consider like that's a project. If you had a specific thing that you wanted to do, I have lots of these ideas that I want to do. But um, then it's just for me, it's as simple as ordering like these things. So this is, I just happen to study dope like. Um, Melanin, so your skin, all the you know all the, the, the pigmentation, and most animals on Earth use melanin, and I just have it, and it has weird electrical properties. It has all these kind, kind of kinds of things, and, um, and I just happen to know a lot about it. And so I started adding dopamine precursors to it to see if I could make like a silk dopamine, and this is really tough, uh, which is kind of cool. It's like a whole different, it's a whole different beast. But, um, you broke it! No. Uh, the middle part. Just the other stuff. Yeah, middle part <laughs> stuff. That's like another question. The strength of it. Is it still, do you know any sense if it's going to be stronger as a sheet or as a woven fabric? Or is it have, does it have properties that would actually benefit from being woven? Or different clear I don't know. I, I think one of the things you can, that's interesting is you can control that. You can control how strong it is, and you can control on scales that you couldn't control otherwise. So with this, we could theoretically, when you're doing it, you you, you could add melanin, which would 
um, basically it bonds differently and it creates um, uh, bonding in this direction as well as in this direction. So you, it starts to become a lot tougher. Um, and so in that case, when you do that, you um, and then you made a fiber out of it, it would be a surprisingly tough fiber. More than just using like this, just a normal one. Or if you added, they were really excited about shrilk because by adding the shrimp shell protein, it made it a lot tougher than just the silk alone. Um, and it seemed to be really easy to do. Mm -hmm. And so um, things like that, you, you can start to control and do. Um, it, it sounds like what, what might be a good thing to do too is maybe just to um, get a partnership with someone at the UW who does like materials testing and just or a local university and just to have um, send them little samples of things that people want want to make and be like how tough are all these things or just go over in the boat and try it ourselves but like just to pull them I worked in a lab that did that for natural proteins we would do things like we would take scanning electron microscopes, put the little needle on them and dent test like things to see how tough they were or um, you'd have this literally machine that like tries to pull it apart and measure how much. Um, so most <laughs> materials labs have that, that equipment and they're usually pretty happy to like, yeah, bring it in, let's just put it in there because that's what they do. They just get a kick out of that. And so. okay, from, from any of this, can you get something that's kind of more elastic or is it that would be cool. So here, one of the coolest things, actually, and this is what like uh, the government really is interested in silk around, and what they've been funding a lot in the military stuff, is the uh, the, the nonlinear response is what is what it's called. So it's elastic materials, um, things that when you pull them, they 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 don't just like get weaker and weaker and weaker. It's like they're really 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 hard. And then it gets weaker. Like so, things that have a non-linear response, and silk mm. does have a non-linear wow. response. Mm. And so that's one of the things that um, is unique. It's kind of unique to natural materials that synthetic materials have a really hard time doing. Mm. And so, silk processing. Um, I don't know if you made a fiber out of this. I don't know if this still has the right structure to have that linear response. I think you could probably. It has a better chance of it. So I know like. Cartilage, and I'm getting really into the weeds here, but cartilage, if, if you ever opened up someone's knee, which I recommend you don't do, and cut cartilage, it would actually explode. It would just it would blow up. Because it's under pressure, and in that pressure, it's actually, it's trying to like push out, and it's got a membrane that's like keeping it in, and so cartilage has this sort of structure of being this tensile material that's already in this nonlinear strain, and so it's really good cushioning. Um, and uh, we just haven't been able to make anything like that at all. Um, we just don't know how to do that. But they've come the closest with silk uh, to do those things. So you can get different kinds of performance out of silk than other polymers. And, and so let's imagine we were like really good at this and we were able to make a new textile or something. The advantage of doing it this way rather than the old fashioned way <laughs> would be that we're embedding things in it. We're creating new structures, new capabilities. Yeah. Is yeah. that really the idea? I want the dress that you put, you know, or the shirt where you put the lucifer on or you wash it right. and it glows for two, two, two days and right. then, you know. Whenever right. you want it to glow again. When it's time to wash it again. Yes. You know, it tells you. Oh, yeah. Or, or, or <laughs> man, you smell and I'm glowing to see it. That's right? the teenager yeah. shirt. Yeah. <laughs> totally. It's the new additions that are that are valuable. So, so you're talking about that it, it molds on a nanoscale. And so you can, like, maybe, like you had the prismatic. Yes. Back there. Yep. Uh, and that's, you can take advantage of that. Yeah. That's what I'm geeky most excited about because yeah. it feels yeah. like it's easy. My only thing is, so my one of my experiments that I want to do is pour it on the back of a leaf mm -hmm. and then peel it off and see if it has weird surface properties. Because yeah. this one you can't tell anymore because we've touched it so much. But one side was super shiny, mm -hmm. and one side was like matte finish mm -hmm. because I had it on a matte finish piece of plastic that when it dried it had that. I peeled it off and it had that inverse finish on it, and then the the other side was to the air and it was just. You know, shiny glass. When you're molding it, do you kind of mold it? Um, I didn't for that. And so this is where I think testing it on different kinds of, like they use the stop sign and that worked. Um, but um, 
they also can take, if you can take a PDMS mold, which I've never done any of that, I don't know how hard, hard that is, then you can use that as the, as the surface surface template. Um, so different, like a leaf might not work because you might not be able to set separate it. You might just be stuck there forever. Mm -hmm. Which is probably what would happen. Yeah. To the, yeah. Dissolve out the leaf. Yeah. Yeah. Or burn it out. Or something, something like that. Yep. So you try and make a copy of a record. Yeah. <laughs> so you'd end up with a positive copy, so you need to make another negative, but that's still an option. Something you could do that as a test. I mean, those, those grooves are pretty small, but they're not nano small. They're, that'd be, that'd be a fun project. Right? I think they're going to be smaller than the, the square crystals on a stop side, though. I think the grooves of record are smaller than that. Would be good, good to try. Well, it it would probably have a reduction in sound quality. <laughs> would be my guess. <laughs> but maybe not. I just wanted to suggest, um, you know, this is kind of a new thing. Um, 